Jay Bruce, I'm a philosophy professor here and the director of the Center for Faith and Flourishing. And the last year has given us many occasions upon which for us to reflect on our history. There has been such a revolution in sentiments, manners, and moral opinions, to borrow generously from Edmund Burke, that one is almost forced to apologize for harboring the common feelings of men. A common feeling for most Americans is, I think, a great love of country. But given the current cultural moment, many of us are sheepish to express our fondness for this country. We shouldn't be. I love the United States of America, and so should you. But that's not to say that love of country means being blind to past wrongs, to faults, past or present. On the, on the contrary, a characteristic strength of America's people is her ability to recognize that we have failed to live up to our founding ideals. We want to reject the wicked parts of our history, but cling tenaciously to the good ones. And here's something to reject. This May 31st, we will remember the start of the two-day Tulsa race massacre. It's the 100th uh, year later on th this month. This horrific assault on black residents and businesses happened in the Greenwood District. It's a part of Tulsa that was known as Black Wall Street because of the many financially successful African Americans there. And it's right for us to reflect on and reject the racism and violence against the innocent. That's a part of our, of our history that we reject. But let's cling to what is good about our history too. Let's reflect on the courageous and well-earned success of black men and women in the financial services sector. I was reflecting on how if racists wanted to burn black Wall Street today, they would actually have to fly to New York City and torch the actual Wall Street. The success of African Americans in our country, in spite of tremendous difficulties, is a part of the grand fabric of the American story, too. We need someone to help us reflect on how to balance the good and the bad in American history. And we have that man in Wilfred McClay, who will be delivering this year's Barnett's lecture. He's the man who can help us. Tonight's lecture is part of the Ray and Laureen Barnett Civic Leadership Series. Established in 2016 and funded by an endowment created with gifts from the Barnett family and donations for more than 20 organizations and individuals. The series, which brings a speaker of JBU to JBU each academic year, focuses on Christian leadership and addresses the intersection of faith and public service. One of Ray and Laureen's main focuses and passions for several years was the Boy and Girl States Organization, for which they recruited over 300 junior year boys and girls from the Siloam Springs area and raised scholarship money for their tuition and drove them round trip to UCA and Conway and Harding University in Searcy. Ray pastored and preached at many of the small churches in the area, with Laureen faithfully serving alongside, and once retired from the ministry, they remained active in their local church. Ray taught many Sunday school classes and led adult Bible studies and authored and disposed numerous writings on various subjects. Their home was always open and a place of love, nourishment, and encouragement to people from all walks of life. It never mattered whether the people were rich or poor, educated or uneducated givers or takers. Somewhere along the way, they came to understand that the world's view of success is about building an earthly legacy, while significance is about creating an eternal legacy. They chose the latter to live lives of significance. They came to understand that what matters most will not be what others say about their lives, but ultimately, and the same is true for all of us, what God says. Ray went to be with the Lord on February 5th, 2015, and Laureen joined him June, June 8th, 2020. But their positive impact on this community lives on. And indeed, their positive impact on this community lives on this evening 
in tonight's lecture on the blessings and burdens of our history to be delivered by Wilfred McClay. Wilfred McClay, who holds the Libby Blankenship Chair in the History of, Liter of Liberty at the University of Oklahoma and serves as the director of the Center for the History of Liberty, will join the History Department at Hillsdale College this coming year. Professor McClay served on the National Council on the Humanities, the advisory board for the National Endowment of the Humanities for 11 years, and he is a member, let's see if I can say this right, he's a member of the U.S. Commission on the Semiquincentennial, <laughs> which has been charged with planning the nation's 250th birthday in 2026. Professor McClay's book, The Masterless, Self and Society in Modern America, received the 1995 Merle Curdy Award of the Organization of American Historians for the best book in American intellectual history. Among his many other books is A Land of Hope, An Invitation to the Great American Story, and we at the Center for Faith and Flourishing are so confident that after hearing Professor McClay tonight, you'll want to read more from him about his ideas that we've purchased 50 copies that we've been distributing throughout the evening, and uh, you'll profit from it greatly. I'll end my remarks by saying that I simply want you, my audience, to show Professor McClay what kind of a warm welcome we at JBU can give our speakers. Professor yeah. McClay. Thank you. Thank you, gosh. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Can you hear me? Yeah, this little contraption here uh, is uh, something I've never used before. So uh, thank you. I, I almost feel as if I should stop uh, after that introduction. It can, it can only be downhill from here. But uh, I, I've been here before and, and a delightful experience for a couple of days here with uh, uh, students and faculty and the honors program, uh, which Tricia Posey, who is here somewhere, I'm sure, uh, was just getting underway at that point, and it was an exciting time to be here. And now I think it's, it's well established and uh, and uh, and wonderful as uh, as anything that, that Tricia Posey ran would be. Um, I'm I'm here. I have a very general topic: the the, the blessings and burdens of our history. And I wanted to, you know, I I don't want to say a great deal about the Tulsa race massacre, except to to uh, to, to mention it, to call it to your attention, uh, is, a, is a good starting point for my comments. It, this is clearly a, a heinous event in our national history, and one that deserves to be remembered. Uh, it, it warrants our, our careful uh, observance of it, uh, our, our taking in that this is something that is a part of our past. We can't run from it, we can't expunge it, we can't will it uh, out of existence. Um, but I think it's recognizing it, observing it, reflecting, uh, maybe mourning on the basis of what we know uh, about that past event is part of a more general process of recovering and knowing and in internalizing our history, our sense of our own past. Uh, and that's a big part of what I want to talk to, to you about tonight is, is uh, why, why study history? Why is the, the discipline of history, both in schools and in our daily lives, such an important uh, part of what it is to be fully human, to be flourishing fully as human beings? <clears throat> One reason uh, to know this past, and, and, and the good and the bad alike, is the breadth of perspective and maturity that it gives us, uh, helping us to respond with a kind of sobriety and courage to the challenges of the present. We are much too prone, and this is particularly true of us today in America, we're prone to the errors, uh, errors of present-mindedness. We think too much in the present. We're, we allow ourselves to be imprisoned in a view of the world that's myopic and shallow uh, and doesn't allow us to think beyond what is most pressing and immediate. So we forget the past. We have a kind of national amnesia, which is 
uh, furthered by the kind of endless flow of new sensations and new events and new information. We live in very anxious times. I think that's pretty clear to everyone here. But it's also true that we've been many times in our history that we're far more anxious than ours, and when, in which the reasons for the anxiety were far more compelling, uh, and times that we prevailed over our challenges. Uh, we need to remember those things. The knowledge of our history in those occasions equips us to move forward, to take heart from the way others have dealt with great and grave challenges far worse than our own. And let me give you an example. <clears throat> and this actually relates to the, the Land of Hope book uh, in, in, indirectly. Uh, consider the situation in 1941. Uh, the, the, not, not the end of 1941, when uh, the United States was invaded in Pearl Harbor by the Japanese and, and was plunged into being an active co combatant in the Second World War. I'm talking about early in 1941. Um, Hitler. Uh, Adolf Hitler was uh, a, a, a triumphantly in control of all of continental Europe. All of continental Europe. Only the British Isles held out. Uh, and, and their holding out was very tenuous. The United States um, was committed to staying out. Uh, we, we felt we had sort of learned our lesson from the First World War. We were not going to become entangled in these European conflicts again. Um, at least there's a strong national sentiment in that direct, uh, direction. So the future of liberty itself, of civilization itself, looked very dim at that moment, the beginning of 1941. However, the novelist John Dos Passos, a great American writer of the 20th century, um, wrote an essay right at this time, published it right at this time, which uh, had these words in it. In times of change and danger, when there's a quicksand of fear under men's reasoning, a sense of continuity with generations gone before can stretch like a lifeline across the scary present. Uh, I say this relates to my book because any of you who have the book in front of you can flip to the epigraph, you know, the, uh, the page right before the table of contents and see this is quoted. It's a part of a longer quotation from Dos Passos that uh, even before I started writing this book, I sort of held that out in front of me as uh, a, a model for the way to think about what I wanted to accomplish with Land of Hope, is to, to give readers, and particularly, as you'll see, young readers, uh, something that provided that lifeline, that lifeline back to the past, as a, a lifeline across the scary present. Uh, interestingly, is those passos must have been tempted, as journalists generally are, to say, we are living in an unprecedented time. Nothing has ever been as bad as this. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and indeed, had there ever been a more fearsome military machine than that of Hitler? Um, but uh, Dos Passos didn't take that route. He didn't choose to convey this idea. In fact, he calls, in, in the quotation you'll see, he refers to the idiot delusion of the unprecedented now, uh, capital N, now. Um, this was, he considered, considered it idiotic to think that uh, the events of 1941 were unprecedented, that there's nothing in the, in the past that could inform uh, and energize people in uh, sort of focusing their energies on the threat before them. It was reaching backwards for him that was a source of strength and sanity. This ought to be part of the way we educate ourselves, we educate our young people for democratic citizenship in our society. We neglect an essential aspect of the formation of citizens. We have been neglecting that for a long time. That's what the formal study of American history ought to be about. And this is not anything that we get by osmosis, just by hanging out, you know, picking it up in the air. It has to be something that we, we acquire in a disciplined way. And we have to make it our own, part of our shared awareness and our common memory, a shared memory, something that we all have, so that it's an introduction to a kind of community of memory. We have not been doing this. 
And without boring you, I'll just give the example that the uh, National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is often called the National Report Card, has steadily shown declines in scores in history uh, and geography. Civics has sort of flatlined. Uh, and uh, and uh, this has been a steady pattern over 20 or more years. We've got to reverse this. Um, uh, Elliot Cohen of Johns Hopkins University said this, without history, there's no civic education. Without civic education, there are no citizens. Without citizens, there's no free republic. The stakes, in other words, could not be higher. So all of that I agree with, all of that is true, but I think there's one other element that is uh, missing from civic education, and Jay Bruce uh, I think kind of alluded to this, that you know, scores on standardized tests, sort of a jeopardy, trivia knowledge of this and that fact, and being able to name all the presidents, and that's all cool things. I mean, that's great. But what we don't have a measure of, a way of measuring, is the depth and quality of that knowledge, how much it represents a felt connection to our past. Um, that connection, that sense of connection to the past is what we most need to recover and restore. A genuinely patriotic education is an education of the heart as much as it is of the head. Citizenship is a, a grand word, but it's lost its luster. Civics has been reduced a little more than the, the kind of uh, game of how a bill becomes law, a user's guide to democracy. Uh, both words deserve far better. They're about membership, about acquiring an enduring sense of membership in one of the greatest enterprises in human history. Um, and it comes from this felt sense of connection to our past. An awareness of the burdens the burdens of things like the Tul a knowledge of the Tulsa race massacre places on our, on our memories, on our consciousness. But it's the, the good things, too, the many, many good things that we've inherited, which we didn't create, which we are reliant upon and should be grateful to others for having brought into being. So a, a, a civic education should bring all of this, this mixed sense of both burden and blessing, uh, along with a feeling of responsibility for preserving what's good and improving upon it. Um, so as I said already, it's an, initiation, it's an initiation, not just into a set of ideas, but into a, a community. It's not just a community of now, it's a community of past, present, and future. It's a community of memory, a long human chain. Uh, there's sort of two errors that I think we make in um, in, in the way we teach and think about educating ourselves, our, our children for the, about the past. It's, one is to be too uh, relentlessly positive, to, to, to view uplift and inspiration as the sole goal of historical instruction, which would mean things like the Tulsa Race Massacre would be passed over in silence. Um, but the, the opposite error, and I think we're more prone to the opposite error now, which is to emphasize too much the negatives of our past and fail to find a balance between acknowledging our faults and our virtues and resolving to build upon the latter while minimizing uh, the former, although never forgetting the former. We must remember those things. Um, so the, the critical study of history is, is a valuable and important thing. It's part of what we do, uh, those of us who do this stuff professionally. Uh, we freeing ourselves from the myths and errors of our understanding of the past. But the study of and development of a genuinely patriotic history demands more than that. It ought to be directed not just toward the accumulation of knowledge, the overturning of myths and legends, but the cultivation of what I call a historical consciousness. Uh, that means history is an avenue whereby the present can, present can escape not only from the past, 
but from the present. Uh, historical study ought to enlarge us, deepen us, draw us out of ourselves into the lives of people radically different from ourselves and to an awareness of them and of a past that is past but is also a part of, of us now. In drawing us out in this way, it cultures us in multiple senses of that word. It's not just an academic discipline. In my view, uh, history should be a, a, a considered formative of the soul, something that, that ma makes and shapes the way that we think and feel. Um, uh, this kind of, this particular kind of consciousness and memory, uh, traits of character that are precious and traits of character that in this culture of relentless change and erasure uh, has all but declared war on. We are, human beings are by nature remembering creatures and story-making creatures. Uh, we, we interpret the world through uh, the, the medium of the stories that we make and that are passed on to us. History embraces these things, even as it insists on refining them by the light of truth. So, uh, to do all of this is to do a great deal when the forces operating in our culture seem to be arrayed on the other side of things, on the side of amnesia. So let me say uh, very clearly that the year 1776 ought to be something that reminds American, Americans that their, their revolutionary forebears, the men that we call founders, created the first government in human history to be built on the idea that each and every human being possesses certain inalienable rights bestowed on them not by their government but by the hand of God. In doing so, they changed the world's moral expectations. They gave it a new standard against which to measure the worth of all subsequent governments, including our own very much, including our own. 150 years later, President Calvin Coolidge observed that, quote, while it's often asserted the world has made a great deal of progress since 1776, that we have had new thoughts and new experiences which have given us a great advance over other people of that day, and we therefore may well discard their conclusions for something more modern, well, that reasoning, he said, cannot be applied to this great charter, the Declaration of Independence, which was, it was observing the 150th anniversary of that. And let me quote again from Coolidge. This is an under, underrated speech, little known speech. He said, if all men are created equal, that is final. If they're endowed with inalienable rights, that is final. If governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed, that is final. No advance, no progress can be made beyond these propositions. So 1776 is a starting point for a, 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 not for these ideas, but for a regime founded upon these ideas. The message of history is not always comforting and easy, and the scrupulous study of the past often requires us to come to terms with the nation's faults. And I want to talk about that a little bit in terms and really that they relate to the Tulsa race massacre as, a, as a, 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 a terrible but not uncharacteristic event in our history. We ourselves have not always lived up to our own standard. Jay said this in the introduction and he's absolutely right. Uh, as a consequence, a lot of Americans, especially young Americans, find uh, it hard to reconcile the impressive achievement of the founders with their acceptance of an even personal involvement in the brutal and dehumanizing institution of slavery. How could such great men have done something so morally contradictory? Of course, it, 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 it's important to remember that as a question of practical politics, the Union could not have been formed without some compromise among the states on the issue of slavery. Uh, this is something 
you acquire from a, a study of the Constitutional Convention and the, and the ends pre events preceding it. Um, but that answer doesn't really satisfy us. I don't know about you, it doesn't satisfy me completely because principles greater than political expediency are involved. Is there a larger way of understanding without excusing the fact of this contradiction? <clears throat> well, I think it requires the exercise of what I call the historical imagination, a, an aspect of historical consciousness, meaning our capacity to think ourselves into times and places and contexts very different from our own. The study of history helps us to do this. It helps us to think of the past not just as a simple projection backward of the present, but as something that is often a strange and different land. The past is a different country, historians like to say. Um, so we try to understand the founders as actors operating in times and circumstances that are different from ours. And most importantly, we should take into account the institution of slavery, not only in early American history, but in the whole sweep of human history. Uh, once we've done that, we'll be in a better position to assess the founders. And too many students come to the study of slavery, particularly in a course in US history, laboring under the illusion that the United States was somehow uniquely guilty of this evil. It's essential to insist that the institution be seen in a broader perspective. It encompasses the full range of human history. This is hard for us to imagine, but it would be entirely accurate to say that the institution of slavery has been more the rule and the, the exception in societies of all sorts throughout human history. And it was the Western world's repudiation of slavery, which was only just beginning to build at the time of the American Revolution, that, the repudiation, that is. That was what remarked the dramatic sea change in the moral sensibility of the world. To concentrate only on the lingering vestiges of that institution in the first hundred years of the United States and fail to see a larger picture, a world in which coerced servitude of some kind had long been the norm for most of human history is to misconceive the subject. Um, it was a remarkable conjunction of forces, moral, political, and very much religious, uh, that acted together to put the ancient institution of slavery beyond the pale for us, something stained as regressive and sinful, a sign of moral baseness, an impediment to human progress, an institution that had existed since time immemorial. Uh, so small wonder that many of the founders were not entirely consistent in their views. They were on the cusp of a moment of great historical change, a change in the moral sensibility of the world. Washington, George Washington owned slaves, but he came to detest the practice and wished for a plan for the abolition of slavery. By the end of his life, he had manumitted all of his slaves. Jefferson, the apostle of liberty, Thomas Jefferson, also held slaves and yet repeatedly wrote against slavery, um, a practice degrading to, to masters as well as slaves, as the enslaved. He had a divided heart and he feared God's wrath. Uh, Madison, James Madison, the architect of the Constitution, made sure that the term slavery was never used in the Constitution. Uh, he insisted it was, and I quote from him, wrong to admit in the Constitution the idea that there could be property in men. He wanted the Constitution to leave room for the nation to evolve toward eventual extirpation of slavery. The great African-American abolitionist Frederick Douglass, who had himself been born into slavery, would point to these very things and, and insist that the Constitution was, I quote, a glorious liberty document in which not a word would need to be changed once slavery had been abolished. So this gives you a sense of the larger picture within which the American struggle with slavery should be under, understood. It's part of the moral progress of the world. The, the movement to abolish slavery, the, it, it first began in the United States, led the way to bringing about 
the end of legal slavery. It might, and it might be added, that, and this is something that's always left out of the picture, that the process of abolition is not complete today. Slavery is no longer enshrined in law anywhere in today's world, but the practice is not gone. Scholars have calculated that roughly 13 million people were captured and sold as slaves between the 15th and 19th centuries. But today, an estimated 40.3 million people, more than three times that figure, that earlier figure, for the whole period of the transatlantic slave trade, are living in some form of modern slavery, according to the latest figures of the UN's International Labor Organization. It might even be contended that the barbarity of today's forms of slavery, were in, which are in defiance of the universal moral belief in the equality and dignity of all persons, is a far greater moral offense than it was in the 19th century when those convictions were less firmly rooted. Be that as it may, what these figures tell us is that slavery remains a morally repugnant part of human existence, much as it always has been. The elimination of this scourge has not yet been fully achieved. Those who fight it today should look back with pride and encouragement to what was begun in 1776. So let me conclude uh, by considering a little bit more deeply with greater specificity what I'm calling the formative role of history. It's important for a nation, for the health of a nation, and particularly for the health of its young people, that they be able to look back to fortifying examples, that, that reaching back like a lifeline to a, a nourishing sense of the past that Los Passos described in that quote. And let me give an example of this. Uh, it, it involves a great American leader, uh, admired all over the world, admired by the overwhelming majority of Americans. Uh, someone who had a, an enormously powerful sense of connection to the past, even though, and I'm about to give it, uh, the name away here, even though he was largely self-educated. That tip tells you I'm talking about Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, we all know Lincoln was a voracious reader, although he mainly read uh, in the King James Bible and the plays of Shakespeare, which were very formative for him. And it doesn't appear he was especially a fan of history in his young days. Uh, James McPherson of Princeton claims, and uh, I trust him on this, that the only book hi of history we know that Lincoln read uh, as, a, as a young man was the biography of George Washington by Mason Weems, uh, published in 1799, the year of Washington's death. Um, this is, uh, the, the, those of you, the historians in the audience will know the book I'm talking about. This is the book that has the fable of George chopping down the cherry tree and then saying he couldn't tell a lie about having done so. Um, it's usually used as an example of uh, sort of history as fairy tale, uh, as, or as hagiography, you know, uh, treating the founders as saints. Well, but Lincoln read this book uh, he, and he was affected by it. And he went on, of course, to have very sophisticated views informed by uh, his reading of the Bible, by the way, um, of history. But there are essential traces of Weems's history of Washington that stayed with him. How do we know this? We know this because he said so. Um, he said it in February of 1861. He was elected president, recall, in November of 1860. And in re reaction to that, southern states began to leave the Union. Uh, at the time, he was, uh, and the inauguration didn't take place until March, so there's a long stretch of time in which the country really was in, a, in, in the process of falling apart. Uh, Lincoln made a trip, the trip from Illinois to Washington uh, to prepare for the, the inauguration, he stopped over in Trenton, New Jersey, uh, and uh, gave a, a speech to the New Jersey sa State Senate. Um, and uh, it was, he was addressing himself to the, the circumstances of the time. 
but he also remembered that Trenton was a key uh, venue for uh, one of the early and pivotal battles of the American Revolution. So he gave this speech, a very short speech. You can find it easily online. And he recalled the effect of Weems's book on him as a young man. Not the cherry tree episode, but his recollection of the Battle of Trenton, uh, which is you know, reasonably accurate for the, the time period. Um, it was fought in December of 1776. Um, and he told the New Jersey senators, in talking about this pivotal moment, that I remember all the accounts they're given of the battlefields and struggles for the liberties of the country, and none fixed them upon my imagination so deeply as the struggle here at Trenton, New Jersey. Um, now, he's a good politician, he's, <laughs> okay, uh, but still, let, listen to this. He says, the crossing of the river, and you all know what he's talking about there, the crossing of the river, the contest with the Hessians, the great hardships endured at the time, all fixed themselves on my memory more than any single revolutionary event. And you all know, for you have all been children, how these early impressions last longer than any others. Underline that. You all know, for you've all been children, how these early impressions last longer than any others. I recollect thinking, boy, even though I was, that there must have been something more than common that these men struggled for. That something more than common, he went on to say, was something more than national independence, something that held out a great promise to all the people of the world for all time to come. And this involved preserving the Union, preserving the Constitution, preserving the liberties of the people, uh, perpetuated in accordance with that original idea for which the struggle was made. And he hoped he could be a humble instrument in the hands of the Almighty in perpetuating the object of the great struggle. Close quote. Um, what a lot for a youthful story to do. It shaped a boy's mind and soul in ways that would have enormous consequences for the man and for all of us. That story, those early impressions, helped him to form a compelling vision of the American past, a vision both inspiring and true that would sustain him through the dark days to come. And nobody had darker days in his administration than Lincoln. Notice, too, that he, although he was a fierce and lifelong opponent of slavery, Lincoln did not focus on George Washington's history as a slave owner, even though he was quite aware, well aware of it. He did not entertain the view that the nation was founded on slavery, uh, what, as the 1619 Project would have it. No, he insisted, it was founded on other principles entirely, principles of liberty, equality and self-rule that were something new in the world. Principles America was born to champion. These are the principles we associate with the year 1776, both the Declaration and this battle at Trenton that Lincoln described. So you're asking, what are we to conclude from this example? Do historians need to retool and and, uh, and write inspiring fables like Mason Weems did, or as we often called him, Parson Weems, instead of hard-headed factual accounts based on extensive archival research and, and uh, methodical uh, uh, techniques of historical inquiry. Well, absolutely not. Uh, history has to be based on the truth, not on myth. We don't do ourselves any favor by oversimplifying the past or failing to give an honest account of our failures as well as our triumphs. The Tulsa race massacre has to be, and, the, and events like it, uh, which are all too plentiful in our history, have to be part of that history. But, back to this question of balance, we also do no favors to ourselves or to the truth if we fail to honor the magnificent achievements of our history and leave them out of accounting entirely, as has become too often the case. Lincoln brought this sense of connection to the past, 
of the history as a vessel of shared memory, of membership. He brought this connection to many of his best speeches. His first inaugural speech, uh, at, at a moment when you know, the South is on the verge of uh, falling away, you know, uh, the uh, Virginia hangs in the balance, uh, and he says to his auditors, you know, the, mi mi the mystic chords of memory will draw us together, ho hopefully. Well, of course, that didn't happen. But uh, he was trying to say, remember, remember what we have been together. Remember the generation of 76. Uh, um, then he does it again. He does it all the time, actually. You know, we could spend all night in here with me quoting from Lincoln's speeches that invoke a sense of felt connection to the past. But one that you all will be familiar with, if you, even if you haven't thought of it this way, is the Gettysburg Address from uh, uh, 1863, November 19th, 1863. Just as he had done at Trenton, so at Gettysburg, he, war was raging around him. He reached back to the nation's birth in 1776. That's, if you do the math, four score and seven years ago, the famous way the speech begins. If you do the math, it ends up 1776. Uh, starting with 1863. Um, that speech is one of the great achievements in human, or in, in human history, the great achievements of oratory. Uh, it's provided a legacy whose preservation, the deeds of the present, ought to be dedicated to. That was what Lincoln said. You know, we, we, we should not leave unfinished the work that those, those who died here have advanced. Um, so it's, it's in the past, in the, in the distant past, and the recent past as well, a source of sustenance, a steadying influence, a focal point for future endeavors, a buffer against chaos and fear, a source of courage, determination. So the past can be for us. I, our young people deserve that. They deserve nothing less. And we're failing them and our country if we fail to give them a rich and sustaining sense of their own past. Would Lincoln have been the leader he was if the version of the American past that he received was like the one our students receive today? Consider the alternative then. If a story of great and estimable things gives us courage and hope in a hard time, doesn't it stand to reason that the opposite, an inglorious story of relentless failure, mendacity, cruelty, despoilation, can have the opposite effect? The inglorious story itself is a kind of civic education. It's not the kind of one we want to give. We in, in higher education are well aware of the, the, the voices telling us we have to be worry about the safety, the safety of our students, uh, which often means not exposing them to ideas and words and concepts that may be offensive or challenging to them, upsetting to them. Um, why don't we ever think about the effects of what I call the inglorious story? The, ne the relentlessly negative view of American history. Why don't we ever think about the effects that that has on their sense of life, of life's possibilities and prospects? Shouldn't we consider whether uh, the remarkably high indicators of unhappiness among our young people, and not only young people, may be traceable to a loss of morale and hope to a belief that they dwell in a country that does not deserve their love or respect. Uh, I, I have a long list of statistics here. Let me just give you one. This ought to do. Uh, suicides among Americans aged 10 to 24, that's young people, increased by nearly 60% between 2007 and 2018. I am. There, there are other similar statistics I could cite. This, to me, I find utterly chilling. We should be deeply concerned about such statistics. Now, no one would say this is all about <laughs> history education falling down. That's the reason everybody... Uh, there are lots of factors. 
But the morale of a nation is ultimately a question of spirit, not matter. One cannot deny that by moving into the vacuum left by the absence of a genuine patriotic education, as well as the decline of religion, the decay of traditional structures of family, uh, the inglorious story has been gaining ground, gaining the upper hand on us, sustaining our low morale, saturating our young in debilitating ideas about the past, present, and future, leaving them isolated and anxious. In a recent story in USA Today about the suicide epidemic, there is this stunning statement, quote, Many children, experts say, are struggling to imagine their futures. What would we do without experts? But, but of course, they're right. Uh, but this should not be such a mystery to us. Uh, the great Austrian psychiatrist, Viktor Frankl, was, who was a survivor of the Nazi concentration camps and wrote about his experience. Uh, a very powerful book called Man's Search for Meaning, which I recommend to all the young people here. And, and, and everybody's young here, right? So <laughs> I recommend it to everybody. Um, Frankel observed that we humans can bear almost any kind of adversity, almost any kind of material deprivation and suffering, except for the deprivation of meaning. Those of us who have a reason to live, who have a task or a goal towards which our strivings can be directed, our, our sense of service, uh, who have a why that animates our lives, can bear up under almost any hardship. But without that why, without that why, almost any how can defeat us and overturn our best intentions and hopes. This obviously goes way beyond merely the question of teaching American history. But it's not too much to claim that a robust patriotic education, which seeks to impart that, and I quote from Dos Passos, that sense of continuity with generations gone before, of which he, Dos Passos, spoke, and begins the process of locating our lives in a meaning larger than oneself. That's a, an important step back from this lonely precipice on which we find ourselves. We have not a moment to lose in getting started turning that around. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you and for your wonderful attention. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. have some time if you want to ask uh, Professor McClay some questions. I'm sure that he will have answers, even if they're I don't know. Uh, or I'll tap dance. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one, but come to this microphone so those that are live streaming can, can hear your questions. Hi, um, thank you for your words. Um, I really appreciate your exhortation to try and find a balance between um, the blessings and the burdens of our history, um, because I think there are both. Um, and, and certainly there are these ideals that we, we founded our country on, and certainly there was um, some uh, things that we fell short of. Um, but my thought um, would be, would you say that there's something you, you mentioned, um, that there were these ideals, and then the, the opposite side is saying that there were these racist systems that the country was founded on. Um, and I think there's a both and there. I think you, there can both be um, these ideals that we strive for and these racist systems that, were, that we were actually built on. Um, would you say that there were racist systems that we were built on? Um, and then I guess my next question well, I'm is sorry, I, I, you know, can you just sort of take your mask off the way you talk? Because yeah, I think that's what, I can't it? understand everything you're saying. So. Okay, I was asking if there were, if you would believe that there were racist, if America was founded on certain racist systems um, and whether you think that those systems might persist today um, and how that might affect what you're saying? Uh, yeah, do I believe in systemic racism going back to the founding? Do I accept the 1619 Project argument that, that racism was in our national DNA? No, no, I don't accept it that way, but uh, certainly I think uh, the racial 
prejudice, racial enmity, racial antagonism, racial projection, uh, racial stereotyping, all of these things are a feature of human history. They're, they're not, we're not exempt from them. Uh, uh, so, but, but I think the whole systemic idea is much more uh, problematic. I, 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 it's, it's, uh, it, and, and especially with Nicole, uh, uh, what's her name? Nicole Hannah Jones, who wrote the, the uh, large part of the 1619 Project uh, narrative. She uses this term that it's part of our DNA, and some of the critics, James Oakes, the historian of slavery, uh, took took umbrage at that, and I take umbrage at that. That this is a a, a mechanical and deterministic way to look at the matter. Cultures are not a product of DNA, um, and they're not su subject to the sort of deterministic effects of that kind of ge genetic uh, predisposition. Um, uh, but certainly, I would, I mean, I wouldn't deny that uh, the, the effort to overcome these, these ugly propensities of human nature has been a struggle for us. Uh, and it's, it's connected with a, an ever greater realization of the implications of our ideals. Hmm. Uh, of they extend, perhaps, and I couldn't read Thomas Jefferson's mind, I, uh, but they extend, extend perhaps farther, th farther than even he was able to conceive. Uh, although I'm not entirely sure about that. Uh, so I... Okay, uh, I have a follow-up question. Um, do you think that we should... Um, can yeah. you, you it's can easier answer. to understand you okay. Okay. for me, and I'm sure Reading the audience, that. yes. Okay. Um, do you think, uh, w would, would you say it would be a good thing to canonize sort of um, the Juneteenth holiday um, as a way to celebrate um, kind of black independence in America? Uh, you know, um, that, that's a very specific question, and I, I wouldn't have any objection to it. It's actually a regional thing, and, and I mean, I, I think it, it would something that would have to require some careful consideration. Hmm. Um, uh, but um, uh, I wouldn't have any a priori objection to it. I think, uh, I, I don't know what's really accomplished by, by piling up more and more holidays, more and more public observances after a certain point. Hmm. Uh, but I don't, you know, I, I don't have an objection, and, and I don't, just as I don't have an objection at all to small towns across the South deciding, you know, that statue we have of Jeb Stewart or Robert E. Lee or whatever, you know, that's really kind of an embarrassment. We, we should take it down. It doesn't really represent what, what and who we are now. Uh, but I think it should be their decision. I think it, it should be arrived at in a in a consensual way by the, 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 the inhabitants, the residents, the people who have membership in that town. Uh, but sure, you know, and we, we uh, look, the pa we're constantly rethinking the past. The past is not uh, an inanimate thing. The past is, and the past, the past changes <laughs> as circumstances change and cause us to look, as we look back, we look for different things, things that we never would have conceived uh, as important, we now do, uh, and other things that, that, that were foremost in the minds of historians writing 100 or more years ago has sort of faded in insignificance. That's the nature of the beast. Uh, uh, so, um, yeah, I look, and I, I, so in that sense, I, I don't want to, I, I, I don't really have any developed thoughts about that particular gotcha. issue, but I don't, right. I wouldn't have a problem with it just as a general idea. Idea. I'd like to. I'd like to see the arguments. I'd like right. to see what alternative uh, observances there are. But um, uh, I think there needs to be, as there was for the Martin Luther King holiday. I think there was a strong rationale for that. It, it was a um, unifying uh, gesture to to uh, you, you use the word canonize uh, to enshrine that uh, as a as a holiday. Um, uh, I think that, that things like that ought to be, we ought to work at arriving at a national consensus about doing those things and not have it sort of represent a, the, 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 um, something involving just one particular group or one group within a larger group. So uh, all of that would make me very wary of just sort of saying, oh yeah, sure. Uh, but it's not anything I would object to and it might be a very positive thing.
right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Am I going to have to tap dance now? Is that what the? <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. That's all right. Take your time. It's <laughs> yeah. Thanks for being here. Um, so about 20, 25 years ago on a trip to Mount Rushmore, I was inspired to start reading presidential biographies. And uh, at that time, Mount Rushmore was strictly seen as a good thing. Uh, now it's kind of being questioned. Um, but I've realized over the course of reading not just those biographies, but others, that there were gaps in my history, even though I thought I was well educated. Uh, uh, for example, I'm reading now or listening to um, uh, David, I think it's Blight's uh, biography of, of uh, Frederick Douglass. Um, he might have been mentioned in a history book that I read at some point, but really, but he yeah. might not have, uh, and I don't, I don't recall. Well, I sure always knew who he was, but uh, well, yeah, yeah. So, but okay, uh, so I, you know, I, I'm not a good example, I suppose. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, I, so I'm wondering where you think um, the the traditional holes have been in our educational in our educations about Americans we probably should have studied about but maybe didn't. Um, and, and, and even not just individuals, but kind of time periods that we might have, uh, that we might have missed. I, I, I feel like I have a... Well, the, the, the key thing, the key word in your question is should. Um, and, what, and, and to sort of say, what, is, what does that should represent? Um, um, I'll, di I'll give you an example of one way of answering that question, thinking about that question, because... Land of Hope is a book that is um, that does not have. I, I mean, it's not devoid of social history, but it does not have a lot of. It doesn't pay a lot of attention to social history, and that's been one of the main focuses of uh, historical research in the last forty years or so. Is is uh, uh, learning about the lives of uh, working class people, lower class people, uh, marginalized people. Uh, and, uh, um, and, and, and just ordinary people, you know, peop the people who just don't, they don't rate historical treatment in older histories because they weren't, they weren't kings, they weren't presidents, they weren't generals, they, they weren't admirals, they weren't anything sort of of note in the political history of the time. Um, and I think this has enormously enriched our sense of the past. Uh, it's something that... Um, that I think is, has been a great thing, a very good thing, except in this respect, that um, we still, there's, there's still should, uh, uh, with regard to what a citizen should learn. What should we as citizens learn? I don't want people to learn about um, working conditions in the, in, the, in, the, in the steel mills of Aliquippa, Pennsylvania, uh, at the expense of knowing how the Constitution came to be, why it takes the shape it does, uh, what are some of the leading ways of interpreting different aspects of the Constitution, reading the Federalist Papers. Uh, th these, to me, are sort of uh, permanent fixtures in the education of citizens, uh, and there are many others uh, 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 like that. So, I don't, I, and I fear that a lot of people, my generation uh, of graduate students, um, uh, came out of graduate school without a sense of that. I mean, they might have to develop it in order to teach it uh, <laughs> to their classes, but they 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 didn't study uh, these things. They they and they're they're. Uh, um, uh, I, I have memories of uh, of preparing for prelims with other people and and. So <laughs> Do you, what is the Wilmot proviso? I have forgotten that. You know, and, and uh, uh, you probably don't know either, but. Uh, <laughs> It was very important in earlier histories of the coming of the Civil War and the anti-slavery, development of anti-slavery. But um, uh, I don't think we can neglect the, that, that, that stuff. Uh, so I, obviously the, the ideal answer to should would be everything, you know, that, that political history, diplomatic history, which is woefully neglected. Um, you know, there's a special kind of thinking cap that you have to put on to think about diplomacy between and among nations. And I think 
a lot of very well-educated Americans simply don't have that, they, 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 and it's because they've never studied the way that, that, uh, that foreign relations are actually conducted, have been actually conducted in the past. So they have uh, implausible ideas, shall we say, about how, how to arrive at finding uh, agreements between and among nations. I, I could go on, but, I, but so I think, I think we have to think about what is it that we want citizens to know uh, and to share. Uh, I think citizens should know about the Tulsa Race Massacre, for example. Uh, I don't think they necessarily, that means they have to spend their lives in penance for it or that it, it even enjoins any particular responsibility on them. That's not for me to say. But I think they should know about it. I think they should know about these things. Um, uh, and uh, uh, something else they should know that they don't know, by and large, is that the anti-slavery movement was a religious movement. And I'm, I'm saying that because I'm here. But <laughs> and you, you all know this, but it's certainly it's, it's only the most faintly reflected in the existing textbook accounts of American history. It's as if there was a a secular movement, anti there wasn't any secular movement anti-slavery. It was a, a movement of evangelicals and you know, Quakers and other Protestants. Very few Catholics involved, it was Protestants. Um, that, that's something we ought to know, all of us. Great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay, you're gonna, oh, here we go, yeah. My question is to kind of go back to the DNA. Maybe come a little closer. To yeah, so to go back to the DNA thing that you were just discussing, um, I recently heard that Wilberforce's greatest accomplishment was not in a, you know, the abolition of slavery, but rather in changing the mindset of people that slavery was an acceptable like living condition, an acceptable system. And I think about that in conjunction with the idea that, you know, our our reason is and ought always to be a slave to the passions. And so kind of together, I think, you know, in the South, it doesn't seem like we ever had the opportunity during the Civil War and, and with the abolition of slavery to arrive at the conclusion here at that time that slavery was unacceptable in the way that it was perceived in other parts of the world. And I think that combined with the fact that at the time that our founding documents were written, um, a lot of the passion of, of the founders and the people of our society at the time was you know, corrupt and sinful and that it was racist and accepting of slavery. And so I think that taken together, those things to me would indicate that there, there might be an element of our DNA which would be tainted by racism and slavery, provided that that was the passion at the time and, and therefore yeah. our resulting reason was you know, infected by that. What are your thoughts? I don't agree. Okay. <laughs> I think the, the, the concept of DNA applied to I issues of cultural, uh, cultural attitudes uh, and dispositions is a, is a very bad analogy. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to run through all that again, but I think it, it, it's, 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 it's simply a, a misleading way to think about culture. Um, and also, I, always, I, I, I mean, your question made me want to ask at several points, interrupt you and say, you, you, compared to what? Compared to what? Compared to what? What other, what other society in the world uh, does not ev evince these, these uh, flaws that we see in the American founding? Um, and uh, I don't think you'd be able to answer that. <laughs> so, I, uh, uh, so yeah, I'm, 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 not, I'm not on board with you on that, okay? Does it need yeah. to be comparative? Yeah, does, uh, does it need to be comparative? Or of course it, it does. You're dealing with the human race. Sure. You're not, you, you can't single the United States out for a particular moral opprobrium that doesn't, doesn't apply to standards applied to other people. Uh, that's, that's just, uh, yeah, it's just not fair. It's not, it's not equitable. It's not just. Yeah. Well, thank you for your thoughts. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry to be just disappointing, but... <laughs> Yeah, 
thank you as always for a wonderful, beautiful talk. Um, I, I really appreciate your comments about the importance of history for developing a shared sense of community and citizenship. And I, I think as, as I hear you speak those words, about the student in my class who's an immigrant from another country, um, either because their family moved here by choice or they had to flee their country for a number of different reasons, but now they're here. And there's that sense of belonging in two places, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. My heart is there and I'm here, and I struggle with that sense of where I belong. And there's a sort of, almost a, a fear, will I lose where I've been as I participate now in this place and as I'm learning this history? What would be your word to that student? Oh yeah, well that, th look, I think here you've touched on one of the very deep things in American history, the, the, the whole immigrant experience, which has always, I mean, uh, uh, it involves promise, your land of hope, but it also involves loss. And to me, the most poignant uh, example, and you can see this in various memoirs of immigrants, uh, that the experience of, of grandparents who, who are, the, are the, the first ones to come and, they, and their children adapt and then their grandchildren are aliens to them. They, they know nothing. They, 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 or, or even their own children uh, adapt to American life and they, they become aliens to this. And then, so there's a sense of being between worlds, of belonging in neither place. I think that's ex extremely poignant. And that's part of the American experience. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it, it is, uh, it, it's, it's poignant, it's painful. It's, um, there's a way in which, I, I, one of the things I say in the book, my, my, my book is that being a land of hope can also be a land of disappointment because you know, you, what we hope for is often uh, different than what we get. Um, but there's a difference between being an, an aspirational nation in which, uh, which encourages people uh, to come here or which they're drawn, whether we are encouraging it or not, they come. Uh, and being able to fulfill all of the, the longings and urgencies that, that draw people here. Um, we're, we're often unable to, to do that. Um, that doesn't make it any less a land of hope. That doesn't, that, that doesn't imply that a, a, a book like mine should imply perfect fulfillment. That everybody gets everything they want and uh, everybody gets to be the, the uh, star of the football team. Um, it, it's, it, it's not like that, and, and I think there are, um, and yet, uh, people still want to come here. This is, I think, that one of the overwhelming, in, irrefutable facts, that people still want to come here, that, that um, for all of the sort of uh, uh, preoccupations that we have with often very distant um, moral responsibility, very distant from us, um, uh, the people who come here, are, they're, they're not bothered by that. They're not troubled by that. That, is, that isn't a preoccupation of theirs. There is the, this is the place where I can make some material advancement in the life of myself and my family. And uh, as long as uh, that continues to be the case, people will come. Uh, but yeah, I, look, I think this I inner um, uh, sense of conflict that you're describing, it's, a, it's an extremely powerful thing. And... Uh, some of the, some of the best, but I'm like, uh, you know, a very old book that you, 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 I read in graduate school, you probably didn't, but it's uh, Oscar Hamlin's The Uprooted. Yeah, uh, it, it's been superseded in all kinds of ways, but it's one of the books that, published in what, 1951, I think? It's one of the books that really does convey, the uprooted, you know, to be uprooted means that you, 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 know, you may have come from the, Polish countryside or, the, or the, 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 the pale of settlement in Russia um, and ended up on the Lower East Side of New York or, where, or in, a, in a steel mill in Pittsburgh for the Poles. And, um, it's completely different from the peasant life that you knew. Um, I mean, some taste of it, it 
probably a lot of you have seen the movie of Fiddler on the Roof, uh, and, and you know, it's, which is about this uh, German, this German, Russian, uh, Jewish settlement uh, at the time of the Tsar and, and the pogroms of the Tsars that uh, drove them eventually out of the country. And they, they all, at the end of the movie, they're all going to America. Uh, Chicago, New York, whatever. And, uh, um, but you try to think of them roaming the streets of the Lower East Side of New York uh, compared to Anitevka, I think it's the name of the town in the movie. Uh, what an uprootedness there was there. Uh, and it's not just the geography, it's not just the cultural geography you know, from the countryside, the peasantry, peasant existence, to a mod, the most modern city in the world, but it's religion, you know? Uh, uh, and actually, even as Jews come making that trek, they're, they're encountering Jews that are very different from the ones they knew in Russia, you know, German Jews and, and, and Sephardic Jews and so on. Uh, so there, there's that challenge, and all the folk ways and life ways and family patterns, kinship patterns that are all different. Um, that is, yes, that is a story. I mean, you can't sort of, it's not a problem to be solved. And I think so much of history is that way, that, that these terrible things from the past. Um, we can't solve those problems now, but we 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 above all have to remember them and, uh, and, and not view them as that's gone. Uh, in some way in which the past is still a part of us in ways that we, we certainly will not be able to know unless we think about it, unless we, we, we uh, hold those memories. So thank you. Got a great, great, great observation and question. How are we doing, uh, Rabbi? We're, we're out of time, but I did, I did <laughs> want to say that that was uh, a reminder that uh, uh, your, your book title, The Land of Hope, an invitation to the American story, is wonderful, but the conversation here at the end reminded me that as Christians, the Jerusalem above is free and she is our mother, that ultimately our, our land of hope is our citizenship is, is in heaven. Indeed. Thank you, Bill, so much. Indeed. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.